Jane, welcome to Recalibrate Reality. Thanks, Scott. Nice to be here. It's great. And I, and I appreciate you taking the time. I know you're busy. You have the 20th anniversary of the Tribeca Film Festival coming up on, on June 9th. And of course, you're doing this uh, coming off of the worst pandemic in over 100 years. So it's uh, obviously an extraordinary uh, time for you. But you know, I, I'd like to start to give you a little bit of background how Tribeca Film Festival actually started, because I'm not sure people really uh, realize that it really started post 9-11. Um, it's become such a great institution as its own standing. So maybe you can give a little background about the uh, the formation, those early days post 9-11 and how the Tribeca Film Festival came about. Well, um, our offices uh, that uh, Bob De Niro and I have are downtown uh, Tribeca Film Center. We've been here for uh, 30 years, uh, but who's counting? And um, after, after I was a block and a half south uh, when the first plane hit the tower on West Street and was trying to get out of the area. Um, shortly thereafter, like uh, it must have been like four weeks later, um, I went downtown and um, went to uh, Little Italy and there was nobody on the streets. There was uh, nobody in the restaurants. And it was um, at that point, I thought, OK, what happens if we could get I could get 10 friends to invite 10 friends and maybe we'd have 100 people and we could go into Little Italy and help the restaurants. And it was more about have a meal and save a job. So we did that right away. And within um, the, the first one had about 400 people. And the second one we did had you know, 700. And then the third one had over, had over a thousand. And it was at that point that we had thought, I mean, Bob and I had talked about doing a film festival, but you don't quit your day job and start a film festival. And it was, okay, if there was ever a time to start a film festival, it would have been right then. Because the world didn't need another film festival. But at that moment in time, Tribeca did. We needed something to look forward to. We needed something to, um, tell people it was okay not just to come downtown because people didn't want to come from uptown downtown but to come that to tell the world that we were fine and no better way to do that than through uh through film and through uh the gathering together of people and artists separately when that first film festival uh we had invited nelson mandela to come and speak and it wasn't, it was like, it was, you know, we announced we're doing a film festival in November, 2001. We're still in a, a city that was so much in that recovery mode. We hadn't gone to rebuilding at that point. And um, we just didn't think you could put up a, you know, have movies and have people start coming to, to, to movies. So we had asked Mandela to come and speak and he did. And, um, we were on the steps of City Hall, uh, Mike Bloomberg, Pataki, uh, Robert De Niro, uh, uh, Whoopi Goldberg, Mandela. Um, and he got up and talked about the power of movies that when he was in Robben Island, the one night that he would look forward to was a movie night because it was that night that he and his jailers were one. They laughed at the same things. They talked about the same things. They talked about family. It was no longer that sense of who is a prisoner and who is the jailer. They were they were human beings, and he talked about the capacity of what movies and entertainment could, how it just brings people together. And that was very much in in our minds um, when we had started we started Tribeca. When you first did the festival after 9-11, did you expect this to be an annual uh, event? No, I didn't expect it to be an annual event at all. And not only that, but I had no clue when we started and we had announced November, basically Q4 of 2001 that we were doing something second quarter of, second quarter of 2002 that any of potential sponsors would have already spent their money. So suddenly we're out there. And, and it was also when you said something about 120 days, my attitude was as a producer, okay, I can prep a movie in you know three months. I could prep a film festival. 
I, it was ignorance was bliss because um, I think had I realized everything it would never have it would never have it would never have happened. Um, and Craig Hatfoff, uh was also um, you know instrumental and very helpful um, uh, at that time. And um, it's um, it was it was actually Ken Chenault who was uh, then at American Express. Uh, agreed to come in and sponsor the festival. And it wasn't that, it wasn't that, it, oh, this is a, you know, some, he didn't even, he wasn't even sure what we were doing exactly, uh, but he was moving his, um, you know, he was reopening American Express and their office was downtown. And he really did it as a, really supported us as a chance to give his employees something to look forward to when they came back. I remember being on my way home after that first festival and uh, Bob called me and asked me about something. And, you know, I gave him the answer and he said, well, why didn't you tell me, you know, next year, I was like, next year, you've got to be kidding. Right. Well, here, here we are. <laughs> 20 years later. Well, as you said, ignorance is bliss. The other thing I think you, that listening to you and you're seeing is that in these crises like this, there's like chaos and then comes clarity, right? I mean, there's this chaos as to how are you going to put something like together like this, but you're a producer and you're going to just start plowing, moving forward then step by step. And then there was the clarity of the film festival and voila. Uh, yeah, voila, just like that. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's what I always say. You know, it was kind of, that's why I always like the Wizard of Oz and Dorothy could just, you know, uh, click her heels and, you know, go home. I'm still trying to click my heels and go home, but... Right. It's um, look, um, we we approach things those first several years, and I suppose we still do um, at this time. Like where no is not an option, so how are we going to make it work? Well, you know, it's perseverance, right? That's really uh, a key thing through through these moments, right? Is you need to persevere through these challenges. But I think one of the things, and I commend you because I feel. It, it, a lot of people, as we came through uh, the, the pandemic, felt because we had to isolate that it almost was an excuse to not take action. Um, and, you know, whereas, again, you think post 9-11, there was this call to action. Here, there was a period of time we sort of surrendered to the virus for public safety reasons. But the real reality is you planned, you know, you could actually move forward in a safe and responsible way and find ways to help reactivate our city, re-energize our city and, and, and bring it back to life, which is more important now um, than, than ever before after what we've just lived through these last uh, year plus months. Uh, I was obsessed with how we were gonna be able to gather again, um, very much so because that inclination after 9-11 was to be able to bring people together safely and be able to give people a, again, a new memory and something to look forward to. So how are we gonna ever be able to gather? It's our human instinct is to give somebody a hug, is to you know, hold their hand and how are we gonna be able to do that? So um, it was, so we, we, were deter we were determined. One of the themes that uh, comes up a lot as uh, we talked about the COVID experience versus 9-11 was that 9-11 gave us the ability all to come together and try to work our way through the the crisis. And I think the film festival is a great example. Whereas COVID, part of the challenge was, you know, we're we're all by design of trying for public health purposes, staying apart, right? Almost instinctively, countered everything that we think about in terms of of our our community. But even in the face of, of that, you you know, you now have uh, decided to do another film festival. And you know, you started that when when did you start to think about having this festival? You know, uh, we started planning a year ago, uh, but that said, you know, we were pivoting our festival a year ago into a virtual film festival, at which point we also did a series of drive-ins all over the country and uh, Orchard Beach and Nickerson Beach uh, here in New York. Um, we then, um, you know, we immediately started planning for what, you know, what would happen in uh, 2021. Um, at the time we started, you didn't, who thought that it was going to be this long? You know, you were thinking at the time that, you know, you were going to have to be isolated, 
you know, for a month. No one ever thought it was this amount of, uh, of time. Um, but we, as we looked at the schedule and as we started planning for this festival, we really looked at being outdoors and we knew we could move our dates because the whole, the whole industry's calendar of, uh, you know, of film festivals and awards had changed. So we started planning for an outdoor event. We're going to be in all, all the boroughs and, um, you know, from the Bronx to the Battery, Staten Island, Brooklyn. We have traveling screens going around uh, to all different neighborhoods. A schedule of that can be found on our Tribeca Film uh, Festival website. And, um, you know, it's, uh, it's going to be exciting. I mean, we're doing things differently. We're, um, and that's what you have to do during these times. But it's also exciting about the creativity that comes out of that as you're forced to do something that, you know, pulls you out of your comfort zone. Right. Well, even, even when you go back to 9-11, right, you, you said 120 days, you planned the first film festival. If it wasn't for that, that adrenaline and that uh, desire to you know, have the impact on New York when it needed the most, you wouldn't have been able to do it. And here, again, um, you're sort of rising to the occasion because it sounds like you were planning this where still there was unclear if there was going to be the need for extreme social distancing, face mask wearing. And while some of that has subsided, you've had to plan a whole festival, assuming there was going to be all these different restrictions and, uh, and doing it outdoors and, and bring it to not just Manhattan, all of New York. Um, it's been a challenge. Um, but, um, I suppose after 19 years, it's nice to have a nice to have a, a new challenge. Um, and we work very closely with the Department of Health, uh, New York State Department of Health, in terms of what the what they believed the guidelines were going to be by June. And um, so we knew that we would have to be socially distanced. Uh, you can purchase your pods um, in, or reserve your pods in two or four pods. Right now, we're at six feet apart. Uh, I do hope that they'll go to three feet apart. Um, and we also uh, announced that with uh, fully vaccinated audiences, uh, you can, we're going to open Radio City uh, on June 19th for our closing night. And uh, that will be 100% will be capacity. So again, fully vaccinated. Um, so that will be exciting for us. And, and in terms of the uh, events that you're having outdoors and at Radio City, I mean, can you give us a feel in terms of just the, some of the outdoor locations and, and what is your big finale going to be this year at Radio City? Uh, our outdoor locations are uh, at the Battery. There's, that's one of our largest locations. We're at Brookfield Place, uh, the smaller locations, Hudson Yards. Uh, we're also at uh, Pier 76, part of the Hudson River Park. Uh, trust but now. I mean, it will be. Uh, it goes from. Um, it used to be the Toe Pound, where the first uh, big event that will happen uh, on Pier 76 uh, in that park. Uh, we're also at Empire Outlets in Staten Island and Metro Tech Commons in Brooklyn. So um, all over the place. And then our borrow to borrow uh, trucks go from Flushing Meadows and Rockaway Beach, Astoria Park, Van Portland, Soundview, and um, Gladwin Park. So every New Yorker can have a taste of the Tribeca Film Festival this year. Absolutely. And if you can't actually get to one of our physical locations, you can go onto our site and we've launched Tribeca at Home which is uh, you'll see the second screenings of films that are in competition, plus some films that uh, didn't have their premieres here last year that will be premiering this year and some other special um, treats along the way. So that's at uh, Tribeca at home if you can't make it physically to the festival. In terms of the Radio City, which I think is great that you're going to be able to, to bring in full capacity like that. It's got to be one of the first venues of full capacity. I guess this is actually probably the first uh, physical film festival post-pandemic also, right? Correct. We're the first film festival uh, in person in North America So uh, since the pandemic started. So, um, you know, there's a, a lot of uh, 
a, a lot of different logistics than what you've had in years past, especially where you're screening. We have these, you know, giant LED screens, so you, we can screen in the afternoon. Um, and um, you know, again, even even the Spring Studios, which we use as a hub, where we're screening, we're screening a lot of our uh, VR. Um, installations, those are now done where you'd have a lot of people in that room. Those are now done uh, timed and ticketed, allowing you to see all the installations, but we're moving people through in a timed capacity. So, uh, you know, there've just, uh, there've been a lot of, a lot of changes for us. I think something like what we're doing with our VR installations uh, is actually a good thing and something we should adopt moving forward. And, you know, it, this is, uh, speaks so much of what is great about New York, right? And the resilience that we have as a city going back post 9-11. And again, here we are hit with another crisis. And it's, you know, and, and what I, when people would always ask, how's New York going to survive? It's, it's really, you know, it's the business community, it's the civic community, it's the cultural community that, that, that comes together and, and, you know, sort of takes on the, the, the mission of, of rebuilding, uh, re-energizing our city and reimagining it for, you know, uh, for what that recovery would be and, you know, the resilience that we have. And I think this is, you know, you're leading the way here, which is fantastic. And I think the other thing that we've seen is outgrowth of, the, of each of these crises has been new things. So the you know, Tribeca film was an outgrowth of 9-11. Now, even a way that you're thinking about uh, the film festival going forward, you'll probably have a lot of these different elements of them continue to be able to touch more New Yorkers, tell more stories, give New Yorkers uh, an, an ability to, to understand that, you know, the, the, and have access to things they otherwise wouldn't have access to. Without question. Plus, it allows us to um, transport our, uh, our projects, uh, the, you know, the work of these new filmmakers to, um, you know, to all parts of the country. So that's exciting. And, um, you know, to have more of a, national um a national audience and you know eventually uh more of an international audience um but it doesn't go just because you're streaming something on your computer doesn't mean that you don't want to gather and that you don't want to see comedies uh and laugh together because there's nothing like that like you know great big laughter you hear when you're together with a, a, a big audience or or hearing music with with people so um, one experience doesn't preclude the other. They're just different. And hopefully we'll all get to enjoy um, both, um, whether it's at Tribeca or at Radio City or at a Broadway show. Right. And I think that that sort of speaks to one of the great debates post this pandemic, which is that now that people have seen that they can do things remotely, the question is, is that a genie out of the bottle and that more things are going to be done uh, remotely, either through, you know, video streaming or video conference or in, in person. I know in, in, you know, when it comes to workplaces, a question about whether people are going to work from home or come back to the workplaces. And, and similarly, as you were describing, you know, the, the feeling of community and engagement and energy, you don't get that sitting by yourself uh, at home or get that streaming with someone or video conferencing with someone. I, I wonder, though, as you think about streaming in movie theaters, right, because there's there's some elements of of you know of, of different sectors of the economy that may come obsolete or, or not as competitive in a post-covid world do you think that streaming video is going to be something that impacts people going to uh, movie theaters in the future i think the movie theater business model has had to change for a while and certainly when you look at like the day and date and the windowing of theatrical releases so that's had to change that's had to change for a while and it was um you know i produced the movie the irishman and um at the time 2019 uh netflix was asking the theaters for uh you know a i believe it was a six-week window exclusive exclusive window in the theater before it was going to go on the platform and they were saying no they only wanted three months which wasn't the netflix model netflix then went to uh a number of um, independent theaters and we were we were in over 1200 independent theaters and and even more um internationally so that model has had to change that doesn't 
mean that um, just because you watched it um, stream on whatever device you you want that you don't want to go to a movie theater. I strongly believe that movie theaters have to just change that experience. Um, you know, it was so much of it was about leaning back and having a glass of wine and, uh, you know, in these smaller venues, I think we want bigger venues and you want a real, um, you know, you want a, a real experience. It's going to take you to another place. Uh, so it will be interesting to see what will, you know, how theaters are going to recalibrate. Uh, that said, I think, they're, we're all just tired of being on Zoom and can't wait to be in a theater and see things uh, where you're also not staring at yourself. <laughs> right. No, there's, there's no doubt there's a tremendous amount of pent up demand for social interaction. And I think that's going to be, you're going to see that as I'm sure the film festival unfolds with the amount of, of energy of, of all of the participants uh, as it comes out. But I think post that, to your point, um, I think all businesses, all organizations are going to have to say, okay, what was true yesterday is not going to necessarily be true in a post-pandemic world and have to, to pivot, right, and start thinking about, uh, thinking about a post-pandemic playbook uh, to, to run their business to get the best of, of some of the virtual new tools that we've seen and uh, the best of being together uh, in, in, in locations, but make those experiences as meaningful as possible, like you were describing for the movie theaters. Without question, that's going to have to be, I mean, I, that's going to have to be in office spaces too. What do you do to make that experience more enjoyable? You know, I think we've also discovered that um, workplace um, is not just your physical location. Um, and it, you know, it will be different, but I think it's potentially exciting. Um, I also think when I uh, think about the city, I mean, the city at a certain point was, you know, was not affordable for a certain kind of artist to come here and work, um, whether it's uh, um, actors or, you know, other performing arts. Uh, and I think the city's going to just benefit tremendously from a new wave of people coming in um, that are, you know, new creative forces. Uh, you think about, you know, whether it was, um, you know, Soho in the 70s and artists coming in or Tribeca and artists coming in and then everybody else wants to move in after that. But yeah, well, I think that's where we really got to, as a city, come together post this, the you know, COVID, and say, okay, how are we going to reimagine ourselves and and try to reinvent ourselves to be better than we were before? And affordability of housing and creating the, those vibrancy of the neighborhoods and and then and dealing with some of the capacity that we had on uh, you know our transit systems and new things that had come popped up like uh, like outdoor dining that have changed the nature of our streetscapes are. Are great assets that uh, hopefully we'll continue to embrace and will will enhance the the character of our communities. You know, I, I wanted to pivot for a second on um, to something. You know, when I, and I also when I always found uh, uh, special about Tribeca is throughout the twenty years is your focus on giving voice to the voiceless and the storytelling and and focusing on social inequities and uh, and and issues that um, were 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 developing that you know people were trying to understand and you Terry Becker would provide films and documentaries that would provide different perspectives as well as the you know people being brought together uh and now in particular coming off of what we've just come through where we've had you know such a clear inequities of of you know how covid hit and from a public health standpoint on what our recovery is going to be going forward and some of the you know communities that have been sort of more of the marginalized communities in this situation in in this uh, uh, Tribeca Film Festival, what, wouldn't what are you doing in terms of thinking through and and sort of uh, really promoting awareness of some of these social inequities? Well, first of all, Tribeca has always been about having diverse voices. Um, if you think that uh, we were started because of an act of war, uh, in essence, um, and wanting to hear 
both sides of a of a story. There's nothing like looking at a film in in a room with a group of people, uh, a documentary where you're going to you're going to hear different points of view, whether you like them or not. And the one thing about watching a film sometimes is you're you have to listen. You don't you can't talk over somebody. You have to you have to listen. And um, that has been that, that with with some of what goes on um, that has gone on in our body politic and uh, uh, news uh, uh, various news shows. People just talk over each other. You can't hear. So again, it's uh, Tribeca has always been about diverse voices. Um, this year, our closing night is on Juneteenth. Um, so we have a day long celebration of uh, black creators um, and all different subject matters. Um, we're highlighting um, black creators throughout all of our different verticals, whether that's in podcasting or in our VR or documentaries uh, or shorts um, and uh, really celebrating uh, the voices of the African diaspora, uh, with again a special emphasis on uh, African American artists uh, and filmmakers. We're going to give the first Harry Belafonte Award uh, for Artists and Activism um, this year. It will go to uh, Stacey Abrams, who will be here. Uh, so that will be uh, a very special, uh, special day. One of my favorite films in the festival that will be screening on Juneteenth is an extraordinary documentary about um, about Dick Gregory and uh, what he what he went through as both uh, an extraordinary um, comet, but how he was this truth teller and really his uh, the part he played in the civil rights movement and how he really had to throw. Um, his whole body into uh, what he did to um, into his activism to make his to make his point. Um, that will be um, a, that's just a really a terrific doc. Uh, and then we will also our closing night at Radio City uh, is a film that we haven't announced yet, uh, but will shortly. It's the untitled Dave Chappelle movie. And Dave will be here on a special performance um, by a number of musical guests afterwards. So we'll screen his film and, um, and then we'll go have a party. <laughs> uh, it, I've always been left the film festival, like with more insights about different people, different cultures, different character. Uh, and to your point, it feels like when, particularly some of those documentaries, you're stepping in to watch someone's life unfold and, and that you otherwise wouldn't have seen and have new perspective for. So it's something that, you know, I think it's a, a gift uh, to, to New York. Um, and, and when I also think about New York and film, one of the things I always think is special about New York is that it, it's probably like the, the one city, maybe this Paris also, that, that itself is a character in, in so many films, right? And, and, and it's, and I, you know, I, I love it. So I want to just get a curiosity, the, what, if you had to think about of a couple of films where New York plays the starring role, what would you, some of your, your favorite New York, uh, films be? Um, uh, well, there's Breakfast at Tiffany's because, you know, have to, uh, <laughs> um, you know, if you look at, uh, Goodfellas, um, Taxi Driver. I'm not just saying that because of Bob. Those right. were uh, <laughs> I iconic uh, movies. Um, King Kong, Harry Met Sally. I mean, that was, um, I don't know. There's so yep. many, there's so many um, movies made in New York. It was going back to that first festival when I had to start, when we started to raise money and talk about it. Um, the first thing I just remember saying is uh, I fell in love as a kid growing up in Providence, Rhode Island. I fell in love with New York through the movies. And now the, you know, New York needed the movies to come back. And uh, that's, um, you know, I, I love New York as a, a character. And um, I think I always wanted to live here. 
it, one thing also I love about New York and you're doing it right is this sense of civic engagement and love for and passion for this city. You know, I had Marcus Samuelson on, um, and he was talking about his commitment, you know, in, in response to COVID of being so actively involved and trying to deal with the public health crisis and and the community was reflecting on his time of watching people how they responded in 9-11 and watching other restaurateurs and people like yourself. And it shows you that, you know, it's sort of as a as a community, we pass that that forward, the sense of responsibility um, amongst ourselves to make sure that our, our city thrives. Um, I, I want one last question for you. So we have the mayor race uh, coming up in, in June and uh, whoever probably wins the Democratic uh, primary is gonna probably be our, our next mayor. And I've been asking each of the guests uh, a, a question relative to their expertise in the mayor. And you are not someone that shies away from being tapped for public service or, or advice uh, in this regard. So if the mayor called you and said, you know, Jane, I, I need to make sure that New York City stays the, the, the predominant uh, uh, you know, center of arts, culture, the theater, the, the magnet for the greatest talent around the world that want to come live and work here. What, what would you recommend some of the, the, the key things that I, I do from a policy standpoint to ensure New York maintains that position or, or in the world? Well, if you're looking at it and talking to me strictly as um, somebody uh, in the arts, then I would say we certainly need more space for working artists here to exist. We need, they need studios, we need rehearsal spaces, um, we need better tax credits to ensure that people are going to come here and continue to work. Uh, so those are just a handful of things that you start to look for in terms of the arts. That said, we, there's a lot of stuff uh, that, uh, we need to do as a city uh, to get our infrastructure back up and, and running. And uh, certainly with uh, broadband for all is one, uh, one example how we can start pushing that forward um, in terms of the inequity in, in our systems. I think also, Jane, and you've said it before, even on the you know, one of the things about New York is diversity of talent. And we've, I've seen that at the, in Tribeca over the years and not having things like broadband, um, you know, puts people at a disadvantage to be able to share that, uh, that talent or, or have the opportunity to, to grow and expose their, their skills. Right. So, but, but what you laid out, I think are, are clear, you know, it's, 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 we, we, in what we have to think about the ingredients that makes New York, what New York is. And one of those ingredients are having uh, our creative class, our actors, our artists, um, and 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 that diversity of, of actors and artists that, that are here. So we need to make sure that there's the affordability, there's the space, um, there's the uh, and then and the infrastructure in place where they can they can thrive in the city, or the city is not going to be the city. It does. It felt so weird, it, you know, when you think about this, when you just said the city not being the city to hear the silence in the city was one of the saddest things. I, you know, I mean, there were so many different moments that tore your heart away during this pandemic, but hearing, hearing that sound of silence, seeing nobody on the street, seeing nobody in restaurants or stores was just um, heartbreaking. But the, the silence itself, was um, really, I, I was really heartbreaking. Yeah, no, I, I, I remember my uh, first day back in the office in June of last year, coming off the subway and walking down the streets and seeing all of the restaurants boarded up and just, you know, being alone on 50, uh, 50th Street, walking down and to your point, it felt, uh, it, you know, it, it felt like that there was just such a large void of uh, uh, in a city that usually had so much energy around it, uh, that it, it felt like it sucked a part of your own life out of you, right? When you when you went and and we're, we're in the city and that, but it's it's changing thanks to leaders like yourself that are uh, as passionate about uh, about our city and uh, and making sure that we have a, a path forward. And I think Troy Becker is going to play a great role in it this year. So I look forward to it, and I appreciate you taking the time. 
today to uh, to share your thoughts with with us. And uh, and again, thank you for uh, all you do for the city and your leadership. Well, thank you, Scott, for all you do too. I appreciate that. Thank you. We went to the festival, so we appreciate you um, so much. So thank you. Thank you. I look forward to seeing you at the festival and uh, keep pushing through, Make the, have the adrenaline carry you through. There's only a couple more weeks left. It will. It will. All right. Thank Thanks, you. Be Bye. safe. Be well. Speak to you soon. Bye-bye.